Flow makes for interesting transitions, trying to do the sound video and running back and forth. And especially when all of a sudden I realized that we have multiple files for the same songs. If you notice how there were some of them that had the boring white backgrounds that we usually don't have, that's because I don't understand how Uriel has our file structure and so I had to go to some of the older ones. And then we get to the last song and I didn't realize until just now that we had a different arrangement for that with the um, How Great Is Our God that there's not the normal version there and I've heard it so many times now that it's, it just seems like it's the normal version to me. <laughs> that's funny how that, that all works. But let's go ahead and pray for the offering. Father God, we want to thank you for the opportunity to give back a portion of what you've given to us. I just pray that you would bless it, that you would just help to do incredible things in and through your church. We dedicate it all to you. We just thank you and love you and praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Okie dokie. Well, <laughs> today has been a totally different day. And so why don't we just go ahead and jump into the sermon. Um, I mean, change is always a good thing. <laughs> and what we're going to do today, we're going to continue um, our walk through the book of First Peter where we've been. And two weeks ago, Peter spoke to us about hope. And last week, he spoke to us about living holy lives. And today what he's going to talk to us about is how to live in a world where we no longer belong. And can you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word? And the scripture will be in your bulletins, and we're going to read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 25. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. There's such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it's God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled ins their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body to the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Let's start by looking at verse 11, where he says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Do you remember last week how Peter was telling us that we're now foreigners in our old lives? And he's saying that again here. When we're born again, our old self dies. We're given a clean heart, and our sins are gone. And at that moment, sin no longer controls our lives. 
when we're washed by the atoning, cleansing blood of the Lamb, everything is made new in our lives. We've died out to sin. The bondage of sin no longer has a grip on us. In that very instant, we're righteous in the eyes of God and our past is thrown away and God doesn't care about what we did anymore. We're just like a newborn baby. And Peter's telling us here that we need to remember what that feels like because we've been given another chance. We have a clean slate. The prison door has been thrown wide open and we're free. And there's no longer a record of our crimes against us. And what Peter is telling us here, he's telling us that we have to be careful not to let our old sinful ways back into our lives because we do have an enemy and he constantly wages war with the believers of Christ. And the problem is the enemy of our soul, he does remember our sins. And he remembers the things that are slippery for us. And he's good at what he does. And his purpose is to try to get us to fall off the wagon and go back to our old ways. And our old ways obviously didn't work for us. Because if they did, we sure wouldn't have sought out Jesus. More appropriately, he sought us out when we were sinners, when we were separated from him. He came running after us. And we can't let that sin creep back into our lives. And our problem is is that our old sinful ways, they can draw us back in very easily. And what the enemy likes to do, he likes us to remember the good parts of sin. And I put good there in quotation marks because there is no good parts of sin. What I'm talking about things are the things like when you get a temporary high from taking or drinking something or that sensory rush that you get when you're doing something that's sinful. I'm talking about that pumped up feeling that comes from pride when you know that you've put somebody in their place. That feeling of for just about that long that yeah, but that feeling doesn't last. And that's what the enemy likes us to remember about sinful things. He doesn't like us to remember all the bad things and where it leads to. And the enemy is good at manipulating and changing the story in our minds so that we remember sinful things being different than they were before. And when you have that voice in your head that's telling you, remembering you all the bad things and to avoid it and guiding you and directing you, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the other side telling you, don't do it. Stay away from it. Don't get locked into that. And what we have to remember is that when we live in sin, we have to remember the loneliness that comes along with that and how we have a lack of self-worth and a lack of self-respect and all the relationships in our lives that we've damaged because of sin. And what the enemy wants you to do, the enemy wants you to lose the shock value of sin. If the enemy can get you to think this sinful behavior isn't that bad, that I can just let it in a little bit and I can control it, I'm not going to I'm not going to lose control. If he can get you thinking that way, it's not long till we start stumbling. And the more we stumble, it just seems to it just seems to get out of control in our lives. And the way that we start rationalizing things in our own head, that's where we start saying things like, you know what, I'm not going to go to hell for doing this. I'm sick and tired of things like organized religion and rules and outdated things that nobody wants to talk about anymore. If you do anything that starts justifying wrong living, that justifies sinning, it's not far from there till we have totally lost, lost track of where we are. And what Peter is trying to get us to do here, he's trying to get us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's look at verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans 
that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. What Peter's talking about here is our Christian witness. And it needs to be obvious to anyone and everyone in our lives that there is something that's different about us. And the illustration I was thinking of when I was writing this was, if you remember from Saturday Night Live with the Coneheads, we're the Coneheads from France, you know, that obvious difference where if there were three of them in our sanctuary, it wouldn't take everybody two seconds to point exactly where they are. That's how we need to be different. We need to have it to where our lives speak louder than our words, to where you can see, yeah, there's something different about him. There's something different about her. And the incredible thing, when, when we have a past, when we have things we're not proud of, but it becomes obvious to anybody that's looking that, hey, something has changed. There is something different about him. There's something different about him. I see a smile there. Rather than hearing four-letter explicatives coming out of their mouth, I'm hearing them encouraging people. That's how you can tell that God lives in our heart. That's how you can tell that the Holy Spirit has control of us. Now, how does it look being a Christian and showing our witness in the real world? We need to be the kind of people that help other people who are in need. We need to be the kind of people who give somebody who's hungry something to eat. We need to see the need and respond to it without being told that we need to. We need to be those kind of people who go that extra mile. That's when you make the difference. When it just seems like we're going through some kind of routine and we're doing this because it's what we think we should do, that doesn't have near the impact as when people can see it's just coming out of pure love that there isn't some alternate agenda, that you're not caring if anybody's watching you do it. That's, that's when people can see Christ's love is when we're showing His love to others. And that's the best way for us to share our faith with people is for them to see that in our lives every day. When they see us at work, when they see us at the grocery store, when they see us in our neighborhoods, we have to be the same person that we are in church when we're at home and when people aren't looking. And the craziest thing, when are people looking the most? People are looking the most when we're in a crisis, when there's something going wrong. And see, do we lean on God or do we trust in ourselves? Do all of a sudden we go off and start yelling and screaming and going crazy when the screws get down on us? Or do we praise God and say, I know he's got this already worked out for us? And when people can see that, they can see that there really is something different about it, that they can see that Christ does live in our hearts. And whenever we're giving that opportunity to help somebody, we just need to jump in and do it. We don't need to wait for permission to do it. We don't need to wait to have a sign. And we sure shouldn't wait to see if someone is standing around and watching. And I want to tell you that God is watching and He's given us the permission to do good for Him. We are His ambassadors. And He will reward our faithfulness and obedience to Him. And we should never grow tired of doing good. And you may be the only Jesus that somebody sees in their life. And in that, that does carry an incredible burden. And for each and every one of us, our goal should simply be to get to heaven and bring as many people with us as we can. That's what we've been called to do. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Now this is a difficult one for us. And God's telling us that we need to submit to the leaders in our lives. And I don't know about you guys, but sometimes that can be a hard one. And where we need to be careful about that, I can tell you that God doesn't want us to go around bashing President Obama. God doesn't want us to go around bashing Governor Brewer. 
God doesn't want us to go around bashing Sheriff Joe. God wants us to submit to our leaders. He wants us to respect their authority. We don't have to agree with their actions on things, but we need to respect their position. And this is true in all aspects of our lives. We have to be ready, willing, and able to respect anybody in authority. And if you think about it, you know, if we were sitting there and we had a disagreement with the Glendale police, if you have an officer telling you to do something, can you just ignore it because you say, I disagree with this or whatever? If you do, that's where you find yourself getting tased and carping around on the ground and <clears throat> you'll regret that decision. We need to learn how to submit to authority because they have authority. And that's a very hard thing to do. And in the last chapter, one of the things that Peter urged us to do was to live as obedient children. And obedient children aren't allowed to defy their parents' wishes. If they do that, they're disobedient children. And I want to tell you that God doesn't bless disobedient children. He punishes them. And so consequently, we just have to ask ourselves a very simple question. Do you want to be blessed by God or do you want to be punished by God? And that seems like a really stupid question with an obvious answer. But there are plenty of people who go around choosing to be punished. And that's a terrible thing. When we have that choice, whether to be blessed or to be punished, we should always make that choice to be blessed. And that's a choice that God's given us the free will to make that decision for ourselves. And our lives would be much, much simpler if we could just make up our minds to be obedient to what God wants us to do and to get the rewards and the blessings in our life. It's a simple decision. Let's look at verse 15. For, for it is by God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. If we live in obedience to God's will, if we show love to others, if we live our lives as a witness to our faith, people will see that we're the real deal. And anybody who has an argument against you, it'll be silenced. Our faith will be proven genuine when we are obedient to God's will. And one thing I want you to think about, if being a Christian were a crime, would there be enough evidence against you to convict? I'll give you an even scarier thought. If you were convicted of being a Christian, would you appeal the decision? We need to make our faith obvious. We need to make it so that people can see that there is something different. And I praise God that we can openly praise and worship Him in our country and that we don't have to worry about being quiet yet. But we need to know that when that day comes, we do need to make that choice to obey God regardless of the cost. Because this life is just temporary. We aren't permanent residents here. We need to learn to be obedient to Him. And if you look in the Bible, all but one of Christ's disciples died a martyr's death for their faith. And you have to ask yourself, do we have that kind of faith? And I'm telling you that when Jesus comes again, the people with that kind of faith are going to be glorified. And that's going to be an incredible day. And I really do hope that happens in our lifetime. But the people who haven't put their faith in God, they're going to face judgment on that day that is going to be worse than anything that any of us can even imagine. Let's look at verses 16 and 17. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Peter is urging us to use our free will wisely. And he's telling us that we shouldn't sin just because we think we can get away with it. We need to live holy, sanctified lives. And Peter's telling us that we need to respect everyone. And that means no racism. 
ever. That means not thinking that you're better than somebody. And that means showing respect to somebody that you disagree with. And he's calling us to love the family of believers. That means we all need to love each other. And inside the church, that's more important than anywhere. Because if you have an outsider looking in, what's the first thing they're going to see? Do they love each other? And when it's obvious that we love each other, that speaks volumes for our faith. Now, he's also telling us here that we need to honor the emperor. And there is a big difference between honoring and agreeing with. And we don't have to agree with everything that our leaders say and do, but we do need to respect them in the position that they have. And one positive benefit to that, people who are respectful, they get an audience. They get to have their voice heard. But people who are disrespectful, their voice doesn't get heard. They don't get a seat at the table. We need to have it be to where people see us as the, the people who should be there. They need to see that when we're, when we're preaching Christ, that it's real. Not have us see us as troublemakers. We need to learn how to be respectful, yet not sacrifice what we believe. And another thing that Peter is telling us here, he's telling us that we need to fear God. And he's telling us that if we lose that fear of God, it won't be long until we're ignoring His rules. And if you, don't have, if, if you have any doubt in your mind that God should be feared, I'd urge you to read the book of Numbers. It's one of those books in the Bible that everybody skips over. And I've spent a lot of time in it lately. Um, I had to wrote a big exegetical paper this week on it. And in Numbers 12, there was a lady in the Bible, her name was Miriam. And what she did, she spoke out against Moses. And what did God do? He struck her with the plague. Ooh. Scary thing. Just boom. Then in Numbers 14, there were a dozen spies who got sent in to see the promised land. Two of them said, yeah, this is incredible. God's promised it to us. Let's take it. Oh, yeah. That was the last story. And the rest, the rest were saying, oh, no, there's giants over there. There's yeah. giants. There's, they're going to kill us. Everything's going to be wrong. We need to get this stopped. We need to go back to Egypt. We need to all these things. And what did God do in response to that? The ten who grumbled and tried to get everybody to cause a rebellion, he struck them dead just like that. Struck him dead with the plague. And all of the people who agreed and said, yeah, though they're giants. Yeah, this is awful. We, would, we should have just stayed in Egypt. I can't believe God did this. What was God's punishment for that? The spies had been in the land for 40 days, and God told them, as a result of that, you are going to spend one year wandering in the desert for every day that the spies were in there. So you're going to wander around in the desert for 40 years. And everybody who is over the age of 20 years old will not see the promised land. You will die in the desert. And the people have been grumbling that they were worried about their kids and they were going to get killed by these giants and all these things. Their kids ended up being the ones who got the blessings. And two of those young men they were the ones who had faith. They were allowed to enter into the promised land. And one of them, Joshua, he actually ended up getting to be the leader who got to bring them in. God rewards faithfulness and He, dis and he punishes for disobedience. It's a, it's a concept called retribution dogma. We need to seek out God's blessings and be obedient to what He has to say to us. Let's look at verses 18 to 20. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for 
wrongdoing and endure it. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Peter's telling us that we may have to endure hardships in our life because of the faith that we have. And he's telling us that God sees how we respond to these kinds of trials. And he's telling us once again that we'll be rewarded for obedience and faithfulness to him. Let's look at verses 21 to 25. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Peter is reminding us of how Jesus dealt with being falsely accused. Peter is reminding us here of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. And Peter is reminding us that because of that sacrifice, that we can be forgiven and made righteous in the eyes of God. Now there are three ideas that I want you guys to take home today. Number one, our old, our new lives can't look like our old lives did. The difference has to be obvious to anyone who's looking. And number two, we need to realize that we do have people watching our lives, and then we need to be careful to practice what we preach. And a sanctified believer shows respect and shows love and shows kindness to everyone, regardless of the circumstances and who may or may not be looking. And then number three, when in doubt, look to the example that Jesus gave us. If we walk in his steps and his spirit is within us, we're good to go. We just need to live our lives as a witness to our faith. When we do that, God's going to bless us. And we all have to make that conscious decision to die out to sin, to follow Him, and to trust Him. Let's pray. Father God, it's a prayer of my heart to surrender to You. I pray that there's somebody here today who needs to surrender to You, that You would just work on their heart. And when they come to You and ask for forgiveness, that You would just remove their sins as far as the east is from the west. I pray that you would just give them the comfort, give them the assurance to know that you are God, that you do have a plan for us. Help us to be respectful of everybody. Help our faith to be evident and obvious to anybody who's looking. We just love you. And praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen.